What is it, Gandalf? It's Rishoutfield, Frodo. He's been following us for quite some time. Outfield. Tis a pity Nigel didn't kill him when he had the chance. Twas pity that stayed Nigel's hand. It's a sad story, the life of Rish Outfield. A cautionary tale used to motivate children to work harder in school and have sex as young as possible. Ew. But something tells me that Outfield still has a part to play in the Doonstief, for good or ill. I wish this podcast had never come to me, Gandalf. So do all who live to hear the Doonstief. But it is not for them to say. All we can do is make the best of the podcast that's given to us. And you can always skip the banter section or go listen to Drabblecast. You're listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts... Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Stolen Outfield? What did they steal from you? They stole my podcast! How'd you do? I see you've met my faithful handyman. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 82. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Thank you for inviting us into your home. Or ears, at least. Yeah, they may just be out walking around for all you know, or in their car, or anywhere. That's the miracle of modern technology. Speaking of miracles of modern technology, did R08OT get a voice chip? As a matter of fact, it turns out that yes, 08OT has been completely equipped he's been upgraded wow well i'm really curious about this okay uh root why don't you say hello to the audience why don't you shove it up your poxy rectum rich outfield wow oh this was a mistake (laughs) (laughs) so there was a reason why he just beeped and bleeped probably (laughs) hasn't changed and don't forget announcer man that's right the announcer man's still here okay so today we have a story? No, no. We're just going to allow the robot to insult me all afternoon. Oh, cool. This is going to be the best episode ever. It will also be the longest episode ever. I could insult Rich Outfield without pause for hours. Did it just get warm in here? And the smile would never leave my face plate. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a story for you and I promise you it's true. No, wait, wrong show. What a worthless moron. What, what do we do the that- We just tell them what the story is and then play it. Okay. So what is today's story? Today's story is The Lost Boy of the Ozarks by Steve Friedman. Steve Friedman, a.k.a. Neville Franks, is a writer at large for Runner's World, Bicycling, and Backpacker Magazine, where The Lost Boy of the Ozarks was originally published in the November 2009 issue. He has also written for GQ, Esquire, Outside, The New York Times, and many other publications, and his work has been collected in many anthologies, including The Best American Travel Writing and Eight Times The Best American Sports Writing. He is the author of three books, including The Agony of Victory. His fourth and fifth books will be published this spring. They are Driving Lessons and Searching for Mrs. Friedman, a memoir of love, longing, and lousy choices. The Lost Boy of the Ozarks can be found at Backpacker.com, and on the author's website at stevefriedman.net. It will also be reprinted in a random house collection of ghost stories, coming out in October 2011. Special thanks to Josh Roseman, Julie Hoverson, Lizanne Hurd, Juliette Bowler, and Rich Girardi for lending their voices to today's story. Today's music is Wildwood Flower by D-Joke, Omnipresence by Dara Leach, and The Kiwi by The Acousticals. Check out the links. In the show notes. The Lost Boy of the Ozarks by Neville Franks. Good 
Goodnight Hollow, Missouri. A boy walked into the woods, and no one worried. In those days, five-year-old skin squirrels and giggled, and a child could open a sow's throat with a single steady swipe. Before they were taught figures, daughters learned how to season steaming possum meat. Sons of slaves plowed the rocky soil, and mothers bled to death in childbirth. And if a little girl cut her finger, and the cut oozed green, and the finger swelled, then her father measured the child, and he started nailing together a tidy box of pine. In the hidden hollows of Missouri's Ozark Mountains, which is where the boy lived, times were hard. It was 1903, and the boy had just turned eight. But there was game to hunt, hogs to butcher, and there was no pine box or preacher or slab of limestone to mark the boy's passing, because there was no boy. The woods had claimed him. Adults paid respect in private, on sagging elm porches late at night, over lonely, guttering flames. They remembered the child's pale green eyes, the coonskin cap he always wore. They remarked that his stutter must have made his short childhood more difficult than most. Wives murmured to husbands that the missing boy was surely in a happier place. But what they remembered was that their own children had avoided the boy the way pack animals avoid the diseased and the crippled, that ever since the boy was born, he had carried in his downcast gaze something ghostly and damned. Time passed, and when visitors from nearby Abesville and Reed Spring and Chestnut Ridge found themselves walking in the woods where the boy had disappeared, they remembered beatings they had suffered when they were young and, worse, they suddenly recalled the welts they had left on their own children's flesh. They conjured visions of their little boys and girls' quivering lips. Mothers looked up through the thick, fetid canopy toward a sunny and benign forgiveness they longed for, but which the woods made them doubt, and they blinked back tears. Fathers heard the wind make ghastly, forlorn noises in the trees, and the men felt cold, and then the strangers hurried out of the woods, and after a while, very few walked in those woods at all, though no one could explain exactly why. More time passed, and then the only reminder of what had happened was the way some of the stooped, white-haired waitresses at Gus's Diner, hard on State Highway 176, would squeeze their lips together whenever a family with a little boy with brown hair and pale green eyes would sit down at a table. And sometimes, if the boy giggled, one of the ancient waitresses would have to take a cigarette break, and tourists would see her outside, sitting on a pine bench, her shoulders silently convulsing. Then, even the old waitresses died off, and mountains of Oklahoma dust swirled over the land, and noontime turned to night. The Great Depression came, and engineers built Bagnell Dam, and, later, developers carved Branson out of the state's blood-soaked red soil. Midwestern millionaires started flocking to the Lake of the Ozarks, and amidst violin-playing Japanese and joke-telling Russians and cigarette-shaped speedboats that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, People forgot about the little boy who walked into the woods and never came out. Time passed, and men stood on the moon, and a peanut farmer was elected president, and life wasn't as hard anymore, and a family from Eureka Springs, Arkansas, just across Missouri's southern border, drove north toward St. Louis to visit relatives. After an hour on the road, the father pulled over at a shady spot and announced to his wife and two children that the gateway to the west could wait a couple of days because they were going on a little adventure first. The kids groaned and the man's wife smiled a hidden smile. She was in on the plan and she loved her husband's belief in the healing properties of the outdoors. The little girl, five years old, had long red hair and freckles and wore sandals with sunflowers separating her big and second toes. The brown-haired, green-eyed boy was wearing blue shorts and a blue t-shirt and blue sneakers. He had just turned eight. They were bareheaded, so Mom slathered their faces with sunscreen while Dad pulled backpacks and sleeping bags from the trunk. Fifteen minutes into the woods, the boy cried out. He shouted that something had grabbed his hand and tried to pull him into the bushes. Dad chuckled and told the child that it was probably a branch. It was mid-April and the woods were lush and that even if it wasn't, if the boy stayed on the trail, none of the monsters in the woods could get to him, because wood monsters didn't like trails. And that outraged the boy, who said it wasn't just a branch, it was a skinny kid in a furry hat, and why did no one ever believe him? It wasn't fair. He said the skinny kid had been following them ever since they walked into the woods. 
He's right, I saw him too, the little girl said, and the mother decided the children were hungry and it might be a good idea to stop and have some fruit and nuts. But the father thought that children should not be catered to and that their fears should certainly not be indulged, so he insisted they walk another mile into the woods. The mother bit her lip and went along, starting an argument wouldn't help things. But she made sure she kept the kids in sight, because now she was sure her son and daughter were fatigued, too. And when they were hungry and tired, they tended to hit each other. And then, for no reason at all, she remembered hitting her little sister when she was barely old enough to talk. And she thought about the last argument they'd had. And before she knew it, she felt a sob lodged in her throat, and she squeezed her eyes shut to get hold of herself. When she opened them, she caught a glimpse of movement in the bushes next to her son, and she yelped. <coughs> which made both kids scream. Mom broke out the fruit and nuts, and the family sat in a tight little circle on the trail, and no matter how much they ate, and no matter how many times the father told the kids about the great marshmallows they would roast that night, and how they would be able to look up and see the stars, the kids wouldn't stop crying. Then the wind picked up, and the air got colder. Mom took her husband's hand, and she squeezed it, and she raised her eyebrows, and he knew what that meant. They walked back to the car, and all of them felt something chilly and damp on the back of their necks, like something was watching them. Maybe next year they would sleep under the stars. They drove a few minutes around a bend and stopped at Gus's diner for lunch, and after Mom and Dad drank iced tea and discussed Mom's no-good, shiftless ex-husband and argued about how much time they had to spend with him and his sleazy, chain-smoking, cocktail waitress girlfriend in St. Louis, the little boy said he was bored. Take your sister and go look at the fish in the stream just outside the back door, the father said, because he wanted the kids to forget about the fright they'd had in the woods. Fifteen minutes later, after Mom and Dad had reached an uneasy peace about her no-good ex and his shiftless girlfriend, who had invited the whole family up to St. Louis for a let's-get-to-know-each-other-better visit after all, a woman at another table screamed. The visitors from Eureka Springs looked up, and there was their little girl staring into the jukebox. She was barefoot, rocking back and forth, humming. Her parents thought an animal had climbed onto her head, but then they looked closer and saw it was just a ratty coonskin cap. But what had happened to her sandals? Why was she humming? Was that mud on her legs? And why was it red? And where was her big brother? This time, the cops were called. Times had changed, even in the Ozarks, so of course sex offenders were interviewed and the hoteliers and restaurateurs of nearby Branson refused to appear on camera because a missing kid was terrible, but business was business. Then a newspaper editor in Columbia, in central Missouri, saw one of the spots about Little Boy Blue, as the missing child had been dubbed, on the 5 p.m. KSDK news show from St. Louis, and it made her think of something. She had taken a class in rural anthropology and folklore at the University of Missouri before she became a newspaper woman, and the news reminded her of a lecture she had heard, an obscure tall tale about a mysterious little boy in a coonskin cap. That excited her, in the way that missing children and creepy coincidences excited newspaper editors, especially back then, in 1980, when newspapering was an exciting thing to do. She pulled her ace reporter, a gregarious and chain-smoking Irishman named Kevin Garrity, who typed with two fingers off his beat and told him to work the search angle hard. She took the State House reporter, a bookish second-generation Armenian named Edward Aloysius Dorian, who wore heavily starched white shirts and spoke with a formality the other reporters snickered about, and whom they all called Deadline Ed behind his back. And she told him she wanted to know everything there was to know about the missing kid's family that Deadline should pack a toothbrush and be in Eureka Springs by dinner time. The editor wanted something on the creepy historical angle, too, and some local color on the woods and the rednecks who lived there, but the only person she had left to send anywhere was a cub reporter with an overactive imagination and a nasty drinking habit, a dreamy mope she'd been thinking of firing almost since the day she had hired him. That's where I come in. I covered the animal beat. I wrote stories about trick pigs and clever ferrets. I covered jumping frog contests and birthday parties for overweight cats. If there was a fire and a pet and survivors, it was my byline on the piece. Snuffy the rabbit smelled smoke and bleated loud enough to wake Harold and Irma Flance. And in that magical moment with that simple utterance, Snuffy was forever transformed from mere pet to beloved and immortal big-eared hero. Animals didn't talk, so I didn't have to interview them. Animals didn't sue, so I didn't have to worry too much about getting facts straight. 
The Animal Beat provided a safe place for a reporter like me who, in his first two weeks on the job, had reported that a Chamber of Commerce director had been sued for sexual harassment when he hadn't, and who had shown up for work late and hungover four times. I had been at the Columbia Daily Tribune for just a year and was already, barely 25, a floridly failing journalist. I suspect that Carolyn Sissy White, the editor, was hoping I'd become so humiliated at writing about hamsters and puppies that I'd quit. She overestimated my sense of personal dignity. I want atmosphere, she said after she'd summoned me to her office. And leave out the telepathic shih tzus, okay? Hey, come on. My Jim the Wonder Dog feature won second place in the Boone County Press Association. All I want is a mood piece. A mood piece with actual facts, not animals. Got it, boss. Can do. And no drinking. If I even suspect that you've been juicing, you're going to wish you were writing about mind-reading squirrels. You think the animal beat's bad? If I find out you've been hitting the bottle, you're going to be interviewing farmers at the state fair about their prize-winning giant vegetables. Can do. Hold page one, above the fold, I said. And Sissy sighed. I drove through long stretches of flat land and gray, hard sky. I had the road mostly to myself, plus the occasional hawk circling overhead and gangs of large black crows that descended, picked at some unlucky skunk's remains, then flapped heavily away. By the time I arrived at Gus's diner, I needed a drink. Instead, I ordered a burger and a cup of coffee. The waitress was slim and had pale blue eyes, and I wondered if she had been working when the couple from Eureka Springs lost their son. The kid had been missing for only three days, but reporters from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and the Kansas City Star and the Springfield News Leader had already been here, had filed big city features filled with hushed silence and rare locked doors and rural mystery and all the other cliches that big city reporters trot out when big, bad things happen in small towns. Then they had packed up, along with the cops and hunters and other volunteers who had searched every square inch of the nearby woods. And now it was just me. Me and the formica tables and knotty wood walls, and in back a bald man in a dirty white t-shirt muttering and moving jars from shelf to shelf. I made a note to myself to find out what kind of wood the walls were made of. That would help with the atmosphere. It was dusk and the gravel parking lot was fading into nothingness, and the only sounds were a gentle breeze slithering through the woods outside, and occasionally, the whispery rubber of a car passing on the highway. When that happened, the bald man and the waitress would both look out the front window, and then, was it my imagination? They would both check over their shoulders toward the back of the restaurant, and the river, and the woods beyond. Best not go in there. The waitress said, jerking her head toward the back of the restaurant, toward the woods. What? Anything else? She asked in a normal, pleasant, I'm just a waitress and not some hillbilly from a horror movie voice. Don't don't go in where? Why? What's going on? I asked. She stared at me. I noticed her looking at the counter, and I followed her gaze. She was gazing at my hands, which were trembling. Are you okay? She asked. Yeah, yeah, you're fine, fine, I'm fine, I lied. I told her I was down for some rest and relaxation and that I was looking for a place to stay. Only place to stay around here is Gus's, she said. I thought this was Gus's. This is Gus's diner. I mean Gus's hotel. Hundred feet up the highway, just around that corner. Easy to miss, so look out for the sign, she said. The peeling sign said rooms available, and I asked for one. Uh, yep, said Gus, or... Gus's employee as he pulled a key from a wooden slot behind him. Knotty pine? Walnut? Elm? I would have to check that out. Pretty country here, I said. Sometimes, said Gus. People go hiking around here? Gus looked like he'd just eaten a piece of bad squirrel meat. You planning to go into the woods, mister? Gus asked. Maybe, I said. Not so smart. Why do you say that, Gus? Ain't Gus, he said. You're not Gus? He spat something behind the counter. Ain't no Gus, he said. Ain't been no Gus for a long time. People call me B.C. I didn't sleep well that night. It was the noise from the woods. It was the river gurgling and twigs rustling and the wind through the trees and creaking. It was a hiss and crack that made me think of a pool whip snapping and a low, soft moaning. It was a thin, reedy animal-like whimpering that haunts me to this day. 
an eerie and primal noise that I wish I would have listened to more closely. If I had, if I had been able to comprehend what the thing in the woods was saying, would things have turned out differently? The thing from the woods cried. It sounded like a person, urgently alive, and yet there was something inhuman about it, too. Something older than the sky, sadder than the wind. Or maybe this was what the Ozark sounded like. I called the newsroom the next morning. What have you got? Sissy asked. I didn't mention the sounds. Well, great stuff, I lied. Lots of local color and some fascinating characters. Plus, some local mysteries. There's a place called Gus's without a Gus, and a restaurant where the waitress and the dishwasher, or maybe he's the owner, look at the woods every time a car goes by. And Have you been drinking? No, I, I told you I was done with all. Have you even left the hotel and the place where you've been eating? You said you wanted a mood piece, right? I'm gathering mood. Where was the last place the kid was seen? Oh, he was walking out of the diner toward the river. What's next to the river? I didn't like where this conversation was going. I didn't like it at all. The woods, I said. It came out as a question. You planning on going there? Well, well of course I'm planning to... Call me by the end of the week. You'd better have a story about camping where that kid disappeared. I walked to the diner. When the blue-eyed waitress brought me my pancakes, I asked if I could ask her a question. You're a reporter, she said. Isn't that what you do? How'd you know I was a reporter? Everyone around here knows that you're a reporter. Since that poor child went missing, that's the only people been coming around here. Ain't no tourists anymore. Certainly no families. Yeah, I'm, I'm a reporter. Have you heard anything about what might have happened to the kid, to, to the little boy? Probably got lost in the woods. It happens. It does? You're funny, Mr. Reporter. She said. You think you're going to find that little boy, do you? Well, no, no. I'm just here to do a mo. I mean, to write something. About the area. You know, any place within a few miles that might sell trail maps? I heard a sharp hacking noise and looked into the back of the restaurant. There was the dishwasher, owner, bald, hairy-armed guy, bent over and coughing. Or laughing. No trail maps around here. Blue Eyes told me. You want to know about trails or anything to do with those woods, you need to talk to Mrs. Loomis, the retired librarian who lives down in Goodnight Hollow, not far from Walnut Shade. I pictured a gray-haired, muffin-faced crone. I saw piles of knitting needles and gangs of house cats. How, how do I get in touch with her? You don't have to, the waitress said. I already did. I drove through patches of blinding sun and shade dark as night. I saw the hand-lettered sign for County Road EE and pulled off the potholed, single-laned pavement onto what looked like a driveway, but was another paved road. That gave way to gravel and the gravel to dirt. The dirt was hard-packed and up ahead, smoke curled out of a brick chimney. Dead petunias were scattered on the side of a white-framed house. She had braces and slim ankles, and the rest of her was covered in a long navy blue skirt and an expensive-looking black cashmere sweater. She could have been 35 or 45. She turned the corners of her mouth up and showed just a little bit of metal and tooth, but I wouldn't call it a smile. She had brown bangs as fashionable as any magazine model, and they framed high cheekbones and hazel eyes. In the white of her left eye was a popped blood vessel that made a tiny explosion of red, perfectly matching her lipstick. Can I help you with something? I'm the reporter, I said. The reporter? Uh, the one who's reporting the disappearance of the little boy? She coughed. <laughs> or was she stifling a giggle? Oh, yes, she said. Beatrice called me about you. I've been out of sorts. I meant to have some things to show you, but my prints were late, and well, you can imagine. Can I get you something to drink? English breakfast tea? Coffee? She turned did something to a vase on a table. The hair that should have fallen over the back of her neck had been hacked off. She turned again, put her hands on her hips, and smiled. Her eyes were like marbles, lovely, cold, and lifeless. What do you think? She asked, flouncing what hair was left. It's great, I lied. Oh, you're lying, but it's okay. Before I could answer, she'd taken my hand and pulled me toward the kitchen. Let's have some tea before we talk, she said. 
I told her tea would be fine, as I wondered what had been getting her out of sorts, besides disappearing children in spooky woods. I also wondered what prince she was talking about, and what a nice-looking woman with braces and tea was doing living in the muddy backwoods, and where was Mr. Loomis? You like being a reporter? She asked as we sat down. Yeah, for, for the most part, I said. I didn't mention Jim the Wonder Dog or Snuffy the Miracle Rabbit. Have you found the little boy yet? No, and I'm not going to. I'm not here to find the little boy. What if I could lead you to him? Maybe that's the moment I should have called the local cops, or at least checked in with Deadline Ed or Kev. Maybe I should have called Sissy, and maybe if I'd done any of that, things wouldn't have turned out how they did. I've always pondered the maybes of my life. It's never helped. Lead me to him. Sure, lead me to him. Right, let's go. She took my hand and pulled me out the back door. Black clouds had piled upon each other, and they sat, bullying and sullen, on the western horizon. We walked around the farmhouse to a small path in the woods that abutted the backyard. My shirt stuck to my back. Streaks of lightning cut through the clouds, but I heard no thunder. My ex said I was hallucinating, she said. He told me no one lived in the woods, it was just coyotes. He told me I was hearing what I wanted to hear. She said this in the same tone of voice she'd used to tell me that she was waiting on her prince. I looked at the back of her haircut. What was the deal with that? That's when I heard the ha, ha, ha sound again. We had walked 50 yards down the path. What had seemed like a cute little trail had turned into an overgrown, weed-choked passage into a dark, dank jungle. I knew there couldn't be a jungle in mid-Missouri. I knew that the ha, ha, ha couldn't be a monster's growl, and that it was more likely the mating grunt of some smallish Ozark's rodent. In a minute, Mrs. Loomis would show me the animal, and I would note its fuzzy ears and its cute wet nose and its funny little paws. It would help my mood peace. Sweat dripped into my eyes. The jungle was getting darker and more dank. The ha, ha, ha was getting louder. This was more mood than I needed. After a quarter mile, the trail ended at a small pile of ash, what looked like a rudimentary barbecue pit at the northern tip of an oblong clearing 20 feet by 15 feet. I saw blood. I smelled meat. The wind had picked up. I thought I heard animals chattering and shrieking. I tried to get a fix on the clouds, but the horizon had disappeared. We were deep in the forest. Fat, cold drops of water fell on us. I had never felt such heavy rain. The woods cried. I heard movement in the bushes. She grasped my hand again. When I turned toward her, she was peering into the woods. I followed her eyes and thought I saw a flash of fur, a shy, greenish, quivering. What's that? I croaked. What's what? She said. In the woods. She turned to me. What was the expression on her face? Amusement? Regret? Despair? It's okay. She said. What is? Everything will be okay. Don't worry. She took my face in her hands. They were like ice. I couldn't remember why I was here. Why had we come this way? Why was she looking at me so strangely? The rain continued, heavy as sin, loud as a guilty conscience. Cutting through the sound of rain, something worse, something remorseless. There was a rattling behind the tree, then primal, urgent moaning. We'd better go, she said. Leave him be. A wave of dizziness overwhelmed me. I clung to her hand. I followed her down the path, out of the woods. The next morning, after a fitful, sleepless night, as I was walking through the lobby on my way to the diner, B.C. looked up from behind the desk, then thrust a lumpy brown envelope into my hands. There were no stamps and no return address. Scrawled across the front of the envelope in what looked like brown chalk was Reporter. The printing had been done by someone old and arthritic. Or a kindergartner. I asked B.C. where it had come from, and he gave me the bad squirrel meat look again. No idea. It was leaning against the door this morning. When I opened it, a puff of dust floated out and settled on the counter, just missing my flapjacks. Inside, I found a black, leather-bound notebook, eight and a half by eleven, thin as a hymnal at a failing church. In faded red type across the cover, oral traditions and folklore among the early settlers of the Missouri Ozarks. I read chapter one, 
The Weeping Woman, the tale of a gray-haired wraith in a nightgown who wandered the hollows and hillsides, pitifully calling for her baby who had died from smallpox decades earlier. In Chapter 2, I met the Old Man of the Ozarks, a petty thief who was imprisoned for vagrancy, and then, when the town jail was torn down as part of some ill-conceived urban renewal program, was promptly forgotten and lived out his years trapped in the rubble, feeding only on rats and cockroaches and the occasional small child who got too close to the condemned property. I flipped through other ghost stories, skimmed legends, and read more nonsense of the sort that has brought shudders of delight to every kid who has ever spent a night at sleepover camp. I passed the morning shoveling forkfuls of Bee's excellent pancakes into my mouth, drinking her strong coffee and enjoying the exploits of the McDonald County backbreaker, the stranger at the door, and the man with the hook. I met the James Strangler, the slithery and lithe creature who lurked at the bottom of the nearby James River and wriggled and writhed until curious fishermen waded in after it, only to be found later washed up on shore, terror in their empty, staring eyes. In some versions of the tale, their brains had been sucked out through the ears. As I mopped up syrup, I chuckled and felt myself relax. The missing kid from Eureka Springs was sad, of course, tragic even. But it wasn't my job to find him. My role was simply to write something evocative. If there's one thing an animal beat guy needs to be good at, it's evocative. These stories from this odd little book would help. I was going to give the Tribune readers a good piece, all right. I would etch some portraits of B.C. and Beatrice the sexy waitress, and certainly the whack job of the librarian. I'd throw in the old man of the Ozarks, too. I would describe the knotty pine walls, or maple, or whatever they turned out to be. I would leave out the bloody meat in the ashes, and the crying I heard in the woods at night, because no one would believe that stuff. Plus, for the purposes of authorial credibility, I needed to maintain a certain flinty-eyed persona. So definitely no ha ha huhs. But mood? Oh yeah, with a capital M. I returned to the book, read in the afterword how tall tales had been part of the Ozarks culture for as long as anyone could remember, how these tales had been handed down for generations, used as instructional devices to impart lessons about human nature and to dissuade children from socially unacceptable and risky activity. I asked B for more coffee. The spooky yarn is pedagogy? Interesting. I sped through the stories again. The weeping woman wasn't just a scary old hag. She provided a cautionary example of what happened to someone who failed to come to terms with grief, who could not let go of a loved one who had died. The old man of the Ozarks? More than a crotchety old cannibal, he was the boogeyman who kept kids from deserted buildings. And any little boy or girl who heard about the James Strangler would surely not get too close to the river's edge. I was composing the lead in my head. If you want a long life for your kids, you might consider scaring the wee ones to death. When I noticed something sticking out of the back of the book, it was a single sheet of single-spaced paper, yellowed and cracking, typed across the top of the sheet, the curious and disturbing case of Ukiah Clemens. I read it while I drank more coffee. The story was different from the others. It read more like a police report than a tall tale. There was no obvious anthropological value in the text. And according to the property records attached, there definitely was a Ukiah Clemens. He was the fourth oldest of eight, the son of a blacksmith, by the only accounts that could be trusted. And there weren't many of those. The Clemens family was, like many rural Missouri clans of that era, poor and fiercely, desperately invested in survival. The blacksmith was a moonshiner and drunk who barely made ends meet. His wife was high-strung, prone to long bouts of silence interrupted by episodes of screaming and minor violence, always directed at one child or another. There was chronic sickness and relentless hunger. Young Ukiah was a lonely child, and other school children shunned him. It might have been because he tended to cling to his mother's skirts, or because he wept easily. It might have been because he was always so hungry. Other children reported seeing him in the woods at all hours, digging in the dirt, at times chewing on wriggling, squealing things that looked like squirrels or snakes he hadn't even bothered to kill. People said that when Ukiah's father discovered the boy eating a snake in bed one night, he tied him to a tree and used his bullwhip. After that night, people said, Ukiah stuttered. He stuttered until the day he disappeared. The exact date that Ukiah walked into the woods is still disputed, the paper said. What is beyond doubt, from school records, from tax rolls, and from birth and death certificates, is that after his eighth birthday, there was never a documented sighting of him again. According to the yellowing paper, some stories said he didn't even make it to the woods. 
One account had him dying at home of pneumonia. Another legend had him bleeding to death from wounds suffered at his father's bullwhip. The most grisly account presented Ukiah, mad from hunger, suffocating and then cutting up and eating his baby sister, then being chased into the woods by his mother, who hung herself from a weeping sumac tree that very night. I heard a clattering noise from the counter and looked down. My hands were shaking again. I dropped my fork and continued reading. Why such a gruesome and apparently pointless narrative has endured for so long, wrote the nameless author of the paper, and why it still pops up from time to time is a mystery greater than the fate of Ukiah himself. I stuck the paper back in the book and walked back to the hotel. Had the insane librarian dropped the book off? Was the waitress playing a joke on me? Back at the hotel, B.C. informed me that a woman named Sissy had called me five times this morning, that it was urgent I call her back. I walked up the steps to my room and started making notes for my mood piece. Maybe I would use the strange sounds in the woods. The eerie moans have haunted visitors to this area for decades, I wrote. That was probably true. I described the flapjacks, friendly, hearty, reassuring fare that offers stark contrast to the terrible mystery that occurred down by the river and through the woods. I had a lot, but I needed more. I knew that if I didn't spend a night in the woods, I'd be back on the animal beat faster than someone could say, Pork Chop City for the Trick Pig. I didn't plan to call Sissy back until I'd returned from the wilderness and my piece was ready. I walked back down to the desk, asked B.C. where I could hire a guide to take me camping. I can do it today, he told me. An hour later, a little after noon, we drove toward the librarian's house. After twenty minutes, just when I wondered, with a chill, whether he was taking me back to the chattering thing by the ash pit, B.C. jerked his wheel, and we lurched left and into the undergrowth. Dark branches whipped the windshield, and I might have squealed, or screamed, because B.C. said, Hold on now. We drove another thirty minutes, though drove isn't the right word, because most of the time we were bumping and lurching. We stopped long after we had left anything that anyone might refer to as a road. The air was thick and sour, and all around was a low insect whine. This was way too much mood. I got out and sunk to my shins in muck. B.C. reached into the bed of his pickup and grabbed two backpacks. Here, he said, throwing one at me. Put this on. We walked for at least two hours. We walked up muddy hills and across streams, and we walked through patches of witch hazel and clouds of black flies. We stopped at a treeless patch of dirt, a rough circle surrounded by closely packed dogwood and maple trees. I'll set up camp here, B.C. said. Why don't you relax? I sat down heavily. I'm thirsty, I said. I got something, B.C. said. But first we gotta eat. It's dangerous to be hungry out here. I vaguely remembered reading that people could live a long time without food, that in fact it was riskier to be thirsty. But B.C. seemed to know what he was doing, so I leaned on my backpack, and the next thing I knew, B.C. was shaking my shoulder, and it was dark. He had a fire going, was stirring two cans with a stick. Grub's ready, he said. What's that sound? I asked. The rhythm was a woodpecker's, but the tone more human. It sounded like the ha, ha, ha at the librarian's house, but now it said... Da, 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 da. It came from deep in the woods, from the direction we had hiked in from. Is this what sobriety was like? Was I going to be hearing that damn noise as long as I didn't drink? B.C. looked at me and snickered. Lots of sounds in the woods, boy, he said. Here, eat up. He thrust a can of pork and beans at me. I didn't like how he'd called me boy, but I was ravenous. I hadn't realized how ravenous until I smelled the pork and beans. I ate until my stomach hurt. Can we have some water now? I asked. I couldn't remember ever being so thirsty. Got something better, B.C. said, and thrust a plastic bottle filled with yellowish liquid into my hand. Take a pull on this. You won't worry about no mountain sounds. I took a drink and spat it out. I don't don't drink alcohol anymore, I said. Better start, B.C. said. I was angry for just a moment. He didn't know any better, and I was thirsty, and no one ever needed to know about tonight. It was just me and B.C. and the noise, the da, 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 do. Maybe a couple of swigs would make it shut up. I took a pull from the bottle, and, and suddenly the woods seemed safer. 
and softer. I took another pull and, and another, and I decided that life was good, and the Ozarks were a rugged but wonderful place, and that I would definitely ask the blue-eyed waitress out on a date when I had flapjacks tomorrow. I resolved that Beatrice and I might make a life together. I decided that we, we deserved a life together. I had another pull, and the duh-duh-duh-doh turned into a scream, da, da, a da, relentless, da, urgent scream, da, but da, 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 da. I couldn't be bothered with it. Da, da, Why had I da, ever da. stopped drinking? Da, da, Every da, swig da. made me more relaxed and happy, da, da, and I was da, definitely da. a boozer again, and I wondered why I'd ever thought I wasn't a boozer, and I took another pull, and I was going to clap BC on the back and thank him for being such a good hotel manager and faithful guide for, for being my friend. And then I passed out. I woke in a puddle of vomit. I could see the glowing embers of the dying fire, but B.C. wasn't on his bedroll. My eyes adjusted to the darkness. I saw a shape at the edge of the fire circle. It was B.C., and he was doing something on a rock. It looked like he was sharpening a knife. Da, 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 da. The noise was behind me, and I turned, startled. Da, 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 da. It was a strangled cry. Da, 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 now I saw a light, too. The light was dancing, da, 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 da. in the same location as the cry. I looked back at B.C., but he kept doing what he was doing. I wasn't drunk anymore, and I wasn't stupider than usual. Asking for B.C.'s help might have been my most reasonable next move. Staying put would have made sense, too. I wish I could tell you why I followed the light into the woods, but I can't. All I can tell you is that I did follow it. I crawled on my belly for 50 yards. When my head bumped into a log, I stood up. I didn't feel hungover. I didn't feel quite sober either. I felt like I was floating, like I had spent my life in these woods. I followed the light over hills and through ravines. My feet must have hit the ground, but I couldn't feel them. It was more like I was leaping or dancing. As I moved, I breathed. And as I breathed, I could feel the woods breathe. I was one with the woods and with the thing I was following. As I was floating through the woods... I heard eating sounds. I don't know how else to describe them. Lip smacking, chewing, tearing exclamations, and wet grunts, and soft sobbing. I don't know how long I followed the sounds in the light, only that the embers from the campfire were long out of sight before I came to another clearing, one we had not passed before. Now the sound was everywhere. The eating, and the sobbing, and the screaming, then slobbering, and then the scream again, and then it was deafening, a shrill, witless bawling. I knew that the sounds were impossible. Maybe hitting my head on the log had affected my hearing. I shook my head, but the sounds grew louder. At the clearing, I realized the sounds weren't all around me. They were coming from the edge of the woods on the other side of the treeless circle. I walked into the clearing, and the light on the other side didn't move. I saw a shape in front of the light. The noise was coming from the shape. I moved closer. It wasn't tall enough to be a bear, but it was upright. It had to be a wolf or some kind of feral dog on its hind legs with its forelegs resting on some slim branch I couldn't see. But it was so skinny, so bony, like an undersized malnourished chimpanzee or ground sloth. Its head was shaking from side to side, chewing... I moved closer. Its head was large and angular and covered with fur, and its eyes were moist and ravenous. I moved closer still and saw that the fur covered only the head, and that the face was pink, and that the forelegs weren't leaning on anything. They were holding something, and they weren't forelegs. They were arms covered in ragged, torn scraps of cloth. I moved closer until I was only ten feet away. Closer couldn't be. It couldn't possibly be. Da, 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 da. The little boy said. I stopped breathing. It could not be a little boy. It could not be a little boy holding a kerosene lamp. I told myself I would never, ever, ever drink again. Da, 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 da. The little boy said. He put down the kerosene lamp. He was wearing a coonskin hat. There was something wrong with his mouth. Something messy. I should have run. I should have screamed. But I did nothing. I was one with the woods. I couldn't feel my feet. The boy walked closer. I realized what was wrong with his mouth. His lips were smeared with blood. He was holding something wet 
and dripping. Don't, 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 don't! The boy screamed. What? I said. And he moved toward me and I saw what he was holding. It was a hand. A tiny little fist. A baby's fist. Two fingers had already been chewed off. Don't, 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 don't trust him! The little boy cried. Don't, 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 don't trust the bad man with the knife! And then the little boy reached out his hand, and he took mine, and his hand was colder than death, slick with blood. I, I, I'm, I'm your f f f f friend He bawled. I heard a high, keening wail, an awful shriek of pain and terror. The little boy in the coonskin cap stared at me with dead eyes, and the shrieking wouldn't stop. And then I realized the shrieking was coming from me. A large man with the sad, liquid eyes of an otter slapped me. What? I tried to say, but what came out was, well... He's alive, the man said, then wrote on a clipboard. Well, 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 I said. I was at the Cox Medical Center, the doctor told me, in Springfield. Fishermen headed to the James River had found me at dawn, passed out at the edge of Highway 176. They had brought me here. Doctors suspected alcohol poisoning, which turned out to be true. But when they ran tests, they also found large amounts of ibogaine, a powerful hallucinogen used by certain tribes in South America. They also found LSD, horse tranquilizers, ecstasy, and methamphetamines. I thought of B.C. and the drink he had given me. You're lucky you're alive, the otter-eyed doctor told me. Having fun with happy pills at home is one thing, but in the woods? That's plain dumb. But... I tried to say, but what came out was blib. After he left, a nurse came in and whispered to me. Your girlfriend's been calling, she said. She sounds angry. My girlfriend? Sissy. Why haven't you been returning my calls? Sissy said when I got her on the phone. I've been calling for two days. We found him. What? Who? No, I I found him. He... Little boy Blue, you boozing, animal-loving happy idiot. He never disappeared into the woods. His mom's ex snatched him. Kevin's source in the highway patrol fed him the inside dope, told him everything. Deadline got the cops in Eureka Springs to fill in the gaps. The ex's cocktail waitress girlfriend wanted a kid, and she wasn't so keen on being pregnant. She convinced the ex that kidnapping was a great solution, so they invited little boy Blue and his sister and their folks to St. Louis, then hired one hillbilly from Branson to trail the car, and called another hillbilly to snatch the kid when he saw a chance. He saw the chance when the kids were playing by the stream outside Gus's diner. It was the second hillbilly's idea to smear raccoon blood on the little girl and tell her that if she said anything, he'd come back and snatch her too. He took her shoes too, so she wouldn't get back to the restaurant as fast. My head hurt. My eyes hurt. My feet hurt. I wanted to stop hurting. I wondered what time it was. I wondered if there was a bar nearby. And the coonskin hat? Weird thing about that. No one knows where the hat came from. After the boy was found, the little girl kept babbling about a stuttering child in the woods. How he was hungry and didn't want to hurt anyone. She said he gave her the hat. She kept crying and yelling to the cops that they had to go back and save the kid. Finally, a paramedic gave her a sedative to shut her up. She'll probably sleep for a week. I would find the bar, and I would treat myself to a beer, and I would drink until I didn't hurt anymore. I would remind myself that scared little girls make up stories every day, and that hallucinogenic drugs make even flinty-eyed reporters imagine things. And I would drink some more, and I would go back to school, and I would become an accountant. I would drink lots and lots of beer. So, little boy, Blue's okay. Yep, home sweet home. A pizza delivery guy saw his picture in the news and spotted him at the ex's house. The ex and his shifty gal pal are going away for a long, long time. Deadline Ed said the cops are still looking for the first hillbilly. But Kev's working on a piece about how they arrested the second one yesterday, the Snatcher. They caught him in the woods near Goodnight Hollow. Nasty piece of work, that one. Top suspect in five or six murders down there in Deliverance Land, but they never had enough evidence to convict him. He liked knives, though. Everyone knows that. Funny, huh? Funny? What's funny? A psycho like that, with all those knives, running a hotel. I thought I was going to throw up. What did you say his name was? Clemens. His first name? Balthazar. Although everyone down there called him B.C. I shut my eyes, saw the man by the rock, 
backlit by fire. I saw the man in the woods, hunched over a rock, sharpening his knife. The bad man. Hey. Sissy snapped. Are you still there? Or are you tripping your juicehead wonder dog's skull off? No. I, I mean, yeah, I, I'm still here. I could hear her sigh. Right. Sure you are. The nurse told me all about your pharmacological celebration in the trees. I wish I could say I was surprised. Get your ass back to town. We have the kids' turtle race that needs to be written up. And then it's time for the state fair and the biggest pumpkin in Boone County contest. Guess who's covering it? Kevin and Deadline won state reporting awards for their little boy blue coverage and got raises. Sissy spiked my mood piece. She told me no one cared about local legends or spooky dishwashers or librarians with emotional problems. It turned out that Mrs. Loomis was bipolar, that after she miscarried, which led to her divorce, she started seeing forest children and was institutionalized briefly, and that shortly before the kid from Eureka Springs was grabbed, the librarian had gone off her meds and joined a coven of Wiccans. That explained the dead flowers and the haircut. Back on the beat where I had always belonged, I wrote a story about a singing guinea pig named Tess, and its owner, a stockbroker referred to as jolly and portly if a slight bit socially retarded. How was I supposed to know that Tess's owner was country club buddies with a Tribune publisher? The publisher had a talk with Sissy, who, when it came to the subject of me, didn't need much talking to. Sissy called me into her office on a bright spring Friday afternoon, a full year after my trip to the Ozarks. As the great poet wrote, she said, April is the cruelest month. Huh, I said. And then she told me that even though I'd always struggled with facts... She liked my way with words and admired my imagination, and she wished me nothing but the best. Then she told me to clean out my desk. I took a road trip because I didn't know what else to do. I pointed my car toward Northern California, where I had always imagined quiet, friendly little streams and springy meadows and people with good skin and strong handshakes. But somehow I ended up behind a plate of flapjacks and a steaming cup of coffee next to a twisting stream hard on Missouri State Highway 176. A little voice had been whispering to me ever since the otter-eyed doctor had wakened me, telling me to slow down, telling me that if I wanted happiness, happiness was waiting for me, that peace was slinging hash, that serenity had blue eyes, and that her name was Beatrice. As usual, the little voice was feeding me a line. B and I dated for a few months, until she told me she was sick to death of the country and of the Ozarks, and she wanted to move to the big city, and what was wrong with me, and would I ever grow up and stop looking for things that never were? I don't know if I ever did. I don't know if I ever have. Little Boy Blue was lost, and then he was found. And now he's an adult, older than I was when I walked into the woods and the woods claimed me. You don't know about him because he stopped doing interviews a long time ago. He wants people to forget about him. I don't blame him. Sometimes I wish I could forget about him. I'm different now. The world is different. Things have changed, even in the hidden hollows of southern Missouri. Millionaires still haul their fancy speedboats to the Lake of the Ozarks, and they tie up together and drink too much, and the girls take off their shirts, but now you can see it all on the internet. Missing kids, especially cute white ones, are gone for an hour now, and you can see them on the internet too. The only people who walk into the Ozarks hidden hollows these days wear Gore-Tex. Many carry mesh baskets and hunt for morel mushrooms and ginseng, which they sell to the fancy restaurants where the millionaires like to eat and where possum meat's not on the menu. Gus's hotel is gone, and there's a Walmart where it used to be. The diner's a parking lot. If a five-year-old skinned a squirrel, he'd probably get his own reality TV show. No one writes mood pieces anymore. I think about my failed mood piece sometimes. I think about BC, too, and... Once or twice a month, I call the Missouri State Penitentiary in Jefferson City to make sure he's still locked up and to see when his next parole hearing is so that I can drive to the big house, which is what folks here call the institution, and suggest it not be granted. I think about B too, more often than I'd like to admit if you want the truth. Think about her late at night when I'm lying in bed. But I don't ever talk about her. That wouldn't be the right thing to do, not to Rachel. That's Mrs. Loomis's first name. Rachel and I have been living together for 30 years now, in the house at the end of the gravel road, just a few miles from Walnut Shade, next to the James River, deep in the shadows of Goodnight Hollow. I'm a middle-aged man now, recently retired from 29 years of teaching fifth grade. I haven't had a drink since that last pull of drug-laced moonshine in the clearing next to the fire. Rachel takes her meds, and I go to AA meetings, 
and we read local history books together, and we sit on lawn chairs on the banks of the James River, and we fish, and our sun-freckled shoulders touch. Sometimes on a warm spring afternoon, we drive up to St. Louis to take in a Cardinals game and to sit on the hood of our cherry-red Buick Skylark afterward and breathe in the city smells while we slurp our vanilla milkshakes at Ted Drew's frozen custard stand on Grand Avenue. And when we get home, while I'm inside measuring coffee for the morning and tidying up, Rachel makes a trip to the little ash mound down the path behind the house. She calls it her constitutional. I followed her once many years ago to see what she was doing and I saw her gently place a raw chicken, still bloody and freshly butchered, on a little pile of ashes. That was the last time I followed her. I think of B and BC and baseball games and frozen custard late at night when Rachel is sleeping, and I'm trying not to think of other things. I try not to think about the thing I saw in the woods, the thing I couldn't possibly have seen. I try not to think about the baby's fist with the missing fingers. I try not to think about the terrible fate of that little boy from another time. Trying not to think about things keeps a man awake at night. It keeps me awake. So do the sounds, the sounds from the woods next to the river. They're still there, the rustling and the creaking, the sighing of the wind. Sometimes, in the stillness of the pre-dawn darkness, I tell myself that I've grown used to them. But then the silence will be broken by soft weeping by the fierce whisper of the whip, by a low, soft moaning. The reedy, haunted voice says, and then louder. And then I don't even bother to put a pillow over my ears, because I know it won't help. Hungry! The lost little boy screams. And then comes the rattling in the woods, the urgent scuttling. There is a tearing and chewing as the ghostly, damned thing in the woods falls upon its bloody sustenance. And then there is a horrible, savage slurping, and then an ecstatic lip-smacking. Silence comes next, and I always wish it would go on forever, but it never does. After the silence comes a sigh, night after night, week after week, decade after endless decade. A sigh lonelier than the wind sadder than the ageless river. And then, after the sigh, comes the last thing I hear every night before I finally fall into an uneasy sleep. It is the sound of death and the horror that follows. F-f-f-friends. The lost little boy says. M-m-m-my friends. Author's Note Hi, this is Steve Friedman, the author of The Lost Boy of the Ozarks. When my editors at Backpacker asked if I wanted to write the magazine's first piece of fiction, their only guidelines were great yarn, mysterious, and something to do with the outdoors. I immediately agreed. I've loved ghost stories since I was very young, and as a camp counselor, had told many over the years. At the time of the assignment, I was reading Into the Woods by Tana French. It was inspired by the way that book starts, with two children walking into the woods and never returning. So I stole that idea. I also wanted to work in some of my experiences as a newspaper reporter and to address some of the ways that journalists deal with tragedy, their own ambitions, and failure. Those are the influences on the story of which I'm most conscious. I'm sure there are other darker forces that inform the piece as well. Not to mention that during my newspaper career, I indeed wrote stories about trick pigs, jumping frogs, and Jim the Wonder Dog, drank too much, and was frightened much of the time. All right, welcome back, folks. I hope you enjoyed the story. You missed um, some good stuff while we were gone. Uh, 08 OT just kept on going right on through the story, insulting Rish the entire time. Oh, it was uh, it was interesting. Yeah, what a pitiful creature Rish Outfield is. Did you even know what the word seminiferous meant until now? Well, I, there was that time at camp. Oh, that's right. Hence the insult. <clears throat> Does he have an off switch? Uh, C-3PO had an off switch. Shut him up or shut him down. Are we talking Star Wars again? 
Does announcer man have now the on off switch? <laughs> As a matter of fact, yes. Don't go there. Actually, the, the on switch is the, the thing you actually have to hit here. Is, is he's not real? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> you're mocking me, aren't you? <laughs> no, 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 no. Now, this story first appeared in Backpacker Magazine. Is that right? I know what you're tempted to say, but yes, Backpacker Magazine. It's it's not even an interesting story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. All right. We tell a lot of non-interesting stories, so that's good. Especially you, Rich Outfield. Uh, earlier in the year, my uncle had a copy of Backpacker Magazine that I guess he got at his office. And he said, is hey. Your, is your uncle a backpacker? No. Are you a backpacker? He's a packer. No. He, not, Green Bay. What was the other pack? A Green Bay packer? He's not. It's... I don't know why he got it or where it came from, but, and I didn't know why he wanted me to read it, but he had this magazine. Interesting, because I was starting to think that there was hope for pudgy guys like me that, you know, we could go out backpacking and things like that. So what you're saying is I can't use you as my inspiration. <laughs> I think I've inspired people to take their lives, but that's the most <laughs> inspiration that I've provided. Anyhow, my Uncle John had this magazine, and he said, hey, there's an article in here that I think you should read. I was like, oh, okay, in Backpacker Magazine? Uh, yeah, thanks. And then a couple days later, he said, hey, did you read that story in the magazine? And I said, no. Sorry, I haven't gotten to it. And a couple days later, he's like, wait, hey, what what about that story? And I said, no, I, I haven't read it. Why do you want me to read this story? <laughs> he's and like, it, I haven't backpacked since that time in camp. <laughs> yeah, see, that'll that'll break you of the habit, folks. And finally, I started to suspect that maybe my Uncle John had written an article and it had been published in this magazine. And that's why he was so persistent about, well, you know, read it, read it. I think you'll like it. And so I opened it and it wasn't his name. It wasn't the author's name either. It was this Neville Franks guy. Huh? <laughs> I can't understand why someone would use a pseudonym. That just doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to Mrs. So Outfield weird. the other day and she said, <laughs> so my uncle said, no, there's just a story that – I think you would really like. It's really well written. Check it out. And so I took it to the bathroom with me as people are wont to do and said, I'm going to give this a try just because it's the only way to shut him up. And I started to read it and I was really, really surprised because what is a horror story doing <laughs> in Backpacker Magazine? And, and no offense to the publishers. What is any story? doing in backpacker yeah, I don't, magazine I, I was wondering that when you sent me the story along does backpacker magazine publish stories a lot or are they just a article type magazine i mean i i'm not a backpacker unfortunately so i don't know i, I would like to maybe someday become a backpacker because i'm trying to stop being so darned roly-poly but uh, I would have never expected that. I don't know. Maybe fiction is hang hiding out in all the different places that you would have never expected. I mean, I I've heard they even put fiction in Reader's Digest these days. What? <laughs> well, the fact that it it's not even remotely an uplifting, let's all get our backpacks and go up into the mountains <laughs> right. and enjoy nature kind of story. This should be in like cemetery dance or something like that. <laughs> so that really blew me away. But I also kind of have to ask myself how my uncle john even stumbled upon this story I, I guess maybe it was just luck but i really really enjoyed it and found it to be terribly scary and the description in the text of the sound the boy makes i think that could be interpreted in a bunch of different ways i hope that the way that i chose to interpret it is scary to you but that's how i heard it in my ears and hopefully that makes the story even scarier than it was in the magazine but I looked Stephen up on the website and I contacted him and asked him if we could do his story. And he seemed really flattered by that. And hopefully now that he's heard the episode, he doesn't regret that decision. But, <laughs> but there's something about audio, about a story that's really sound effects heavy. Mm -hmm. or not, not effects, but, you know, just sound heavy that I think – well, this story really lends itself to that kind of atmosphere. And that one that I did – with the guy who was seeing the gnomes in his oh, attic. Oh, yes. That was really sound-centric as well. Yeah. Where he kept hearing sounds and then he'd go up to investigate. So yeah, that, that's an advantage. That's something that our medium has that's really cool and really unique. And maybe back in the golden age of radio, stories like this 
would be the best ones, you know, just huddle around that radio and, and imagine in your head the things that you're hearing. And We need one of those Foley guys that they used to have in the golden age of radio that was just sitting there by a mic with like shoes on his hands and like a kitty litter box full of sand that he walked in and like a big metal sheet that he could shake to do thunder and all that kind of stuff. That would be fun. You know, there are differing opinions about the sound effects and the music the things that we do uh -huh. on our show. And I've, I've explained on the air before that I'm not as apt to put lots of sound effects in my stories. Though I'm sorry, the stories that I edit as much as you are. I mean, you seem to really go whole hog on it. And I don't know why, but it's just your taste and my taste is different. Uh, but there, there have been people who criticize us about that. I mean, they've gone as far as to say that it, it detracts from the story to say there was a knock at the door. And that I just don't get. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, to hear there was a knock at the door. The absence <laughs> of that knock is much more distracting than to hear the sound effect in the background. I I don't know. I, I, I'm sure there are other podcasts that go way farther than we do as far as sound effects, but not many because that's something that you do that takes up a ton of time. <laughs> That's true. It does, uh, it does take a lot of work and give, a lot of time to do that. Give um, me your opinion on this and why you choose to do it the way that you do. You know, I was just thinking about that this week. I, I think it might just go back to our uh, training in college as film students. You know, I think when I think about what we're doing, we take a, a story and then we kind of basically make an audio movie out of it. It's not something that you can watch, obviously. And Putting stuff on film would make it a lot more work and a lot uh, less likely to ever happen um, as a hobby that we would do. But, you know, making an audio movie is uh, its a pretty simple thing to do as long as you've got some good sound effects and some music. And people have complained, oh, yeah, it gets to the poignant part and then they bring up some music. I don't know. I, my personal taste is music always makes things better rather than worse. Maybe other people disagree with me, and that's fine. You know, everybody has their own opinions, and they can do what they want. But, uh, yeah, that's just the way I feel. And so I do. It's my show, man. I do it the way I want. If you don't like I don't, it. I'll do what I want. You can't tell me to do it. You don't I'll like do it, you can bugger off. How could you? And and there are so many podcasts. Uh, there are very, very minimal podcasts where there's somebody reading and you can hear the paper rustling as he reads the book and turns the pages and he makes a mistake and he doesn't correct it and he just continues going on. And that's one way of doing it. And then maybe way, way over on the other side of the double rainbow is a <laughs> – is maybe what Julie Holmes does. It's starting to look like a triple rainbow actually. All the way. Maybe you get into the audio drama sort of thing where it doesn't even have a narrator. It's just dialogue and sound effects and maybe music. And that goes far beyond what we would do. Yeah. Although I, I believe what we do is a performance, definitely. It's not just a reading of a story. Right. I don't know. Sometimes I'm our harshest critic when I hear something and I was like, oh, shoot, that's the same voice I did for that episode two weeks ago. Dang it. That's and the way it is for me every time. It's like, oh, oh I'm doing that Kermit voice again. Let it go, sir. <laughs> But at the same time, sometimes I'll hear something that we've done or that you've done probably and just go, wow, that came out so cool. And I haven't heard the episode yet because it still needs to be finalized. But I got my niece in the room and I told her – because she's the voice of the child. Uh -huh. I, I did the performance that I wanted and then she did it and I played with it a little bit. And hopefully that is as scary when, once it's all edited together as it was. Uh, just in my head, imagining what that must sound like. Because right? he, he had like M-U-H dash M-U-H dash M-U-H was the sound that the kid was making. Mm -hmm. So like I said before, that can be interpreted in any number of ways. Um, I hope you like the way that we did it. And uh, a lot of times in horror, it's the dread of not seeing something, of imagining what you're about to see, of, of what could it be? What is over there? Dear God, what is that that makes horror what so... What is that thing?
Sorry. That makes horror so powerful. I mean, everybody has an imagination that's limitless. I mean, unless we're talking about my cousin, you can just imagine any amount of, of awful thing or what if, or when I open that door, what am I going to see? And a lot of times the movies have been incapable of creating something that's as good as what you might see in your head. I think that's one of the reasons that so many people enjoyed uh, Blair Witch Project, a movie where you see jack shit through the whole movie. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's just your imagination of what is that? What is making that noise? What do the twigs mean? Why did I pay $8 to see this? And <laughs> it's because you're making a movie in your head. Mm -hmm. Your imagination is going someplace that the filmmakers chose not to go. And, and you know, I bag on that movie, but it, it was really, really successful. And it, it struck a, a chord for a lot of people of just that something that you see through the corner of your eye or something that you hear and right. and then when you go out there's nothing there and those things can be the most successful I mean, we talked more than once on our show about battlestar galactica and how it kind of went downhill when suddenly the cylon stopped being just the boogeyman that was out there that we can't understand and they became our neighbors and our friends and our whatever you know we so yeah i think there's definitely something to not seeing the bad guy leaving it up to your imagination i'm old enough to remember the old-fashioned pre-cgi way of making movies where maybe a giant chunk of the film's budget would have been spent on the monster or the special effect the creature or whatever and they try and get people into the theaters by teasing what is it going to look like what's it going to be chud is a good example you know there's <laughs> there is what could they be kind of thing and they wouldn't spoil it in the trailers or show the whole movie uh, they'd expect you to pay your money if you wanted to see it and now i guess everything is possible and everything is cheap i had an argument with a film producer really recently where he had this big special effects idea that he wanted to do in a project we were collaborating on. And I said, what if we just hear it? You know, and the men get all afraid because, you know, they've made a campfire and out in the dark, they can hear these sounds of something out there. And he's like, but why would we not want to show it? And I was like, because it's free <laughs> if you don't show it. Let's wait until the end of the movie to show it. And he just didn't agree on that. And, and you know, it doesn't mean that I'm right and he's wrong or that he's wrong and I'm right. But it is one of those two. Sometimes what you imagine is, is scarier and, and the withholding of information or withholding of the face or whatever it is. You know, back in my comic book days, I always so wanted to see – what Cobra Commander and Destro and Snake <laughs> Eyes and Doctor Doom, uh, or I'm sure there are other masked dudes, look like without their masks on. Green Lantern wears a mask too. You, you have no idea what it looks like underneath that. Ryan Reynolds, actually. I, oh. I hate this. Spoiler alert. Oh, crap. Yeah, it was something that would frustrate me as a lad. We would see the reaction of somebody seeing somebody without their mask on, or we would see their silhouette, but you'd never see. And Darth Vader without his mask on. We wanted to see that as well. Are we talking Star Wars again? Yeah, I, I read an interview with someone. I think it might have been Irvin Kirshner, the director of Empire Strikes Back, that said if he had been asked to return for the third Star Wars film, he wouldn't have shown Darth Vader's face. But because I saw Jedi when I saw it, there, you know, just I, I always knew what Vader's face looked like. And there's something really profound in my opinion, and people can disagree, and that's fine. On Star Wars, there are people that disagree. But there's something profound that this awesome, terrifying, powerful dude was just an old man under the the mask. The fact that he was bald, pathetic-looking guy, uh -huh. kind even, was really cool. And when the rumors came about in 2004 that... Lucas was going to replace Sebastian Shaw, the original actor for Anakin Skywalker, with Hayden Christensen. I was just like, oh, no. Oh, geez. No, no. And he only replaced him for the, the, the last shot where the ghosts come back. Which and that's, that's enough. Awful. It is just terrible. It makes no friggin' sense that Obi-Wan is an old man and Anakin is a young man and Yoda is that sick, decrepit broken Muppet. down Muppet, not the Empire Strikes Back Muppet. And and he's the way he smirks. <laughs> and I mean, I, I know that people will be like, hey, for, forget about it. It's been years. I, I, I understand. But 
there was something that I always really liked about that, about the, just that he was an old man, that he was a, a person just like you and me. I mean, I'm too young to have had debates like on the playground about what Darth Vader was or what he looked like under the mask. You know, if, is he an alien? Is he a monster? Is, is he you know, Jason Chewbacca. Voorhees? Yeah. If I had been 10 years older, maybe I would have created in my mind some awesome visage that was Vader without the mask. And when I saw him and he's just a man, I would have been bummed out. But did you see the Star Wars films in order? I don't think so. See, I saw Star Wars the first time when they showed it on TV for the first time. And it was this big That event. was after Jedi came out. Okay. So, yeah, that was when I saw And I'm pretty sure that I didn't see Jedi until it was on video as well. So I couldn't say wh what order I saw them in. Okay. Well, there's enough about that, I guess. But I I've written a couple of stories where you don't answer the question of what it was. Mm-hmm. And I'm always really worried about that, really hesitant to share that with other people because I think it's fair for them to say, well, what did she see? What was in that room? Right. And my opinion is that sometimes it's better that you not know. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. There was this movie a couple of years ago called Lost in Translation. Hit. It was a, an indie flick. Bill Murray was in it and it was sort of – It was uh, up up for oscars though wasn't it yeah yeah it was an art film and uh, it was something of a comeback for bill murray um yeah i think he did have a, an oscar nomination for that didn't he I, I i don't know it's sort of about a friendship that springs up between a middle-aged has-been actor played by played by bill murray and then this young girl that's over in tokyo in over her head and doesn't know what to do played by scarlett johansson and they sort of hit it off not necessarily in a romantic way, but just, uh, hey, we've got something in common. Let's hang out. And they become friends. And at the very, very end of the movie, they part. And she leans in and she whispers something in his ear. And he nods or smiles or whatever. And then they go their separate ways and the movie ends. And I've heard, you know, people say, whoa, 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 you know, when it's over. Where, what, what, did, what did they say? Hey, Wallace Shawn was in the audience <laughs> that I saw. He was in the theater him. behind you? That's inconceivable. Exactly. They just yeah. ended the movie without telling us what he said. Stop rhyming. I mean it. Some people were really fixated on that. I liked the movie until that part. What did they whisper? What was it? So that became something that people would ask Scarlett Johansson and Bill Murray in interviews. And I think they would constantly say, well, what do you think that she said? And for some people, that works. They really like that you can just interpret it however you want. And for other people, that's really frustrating. And I'm not saying that Lost Boys of the Ozark, Lost Boy of the Ozarks. See, I want to say plural boys and singular Ozark. I don't know why. There's only one Ozark. No, no, there are plenty of Ozarks. There are, are oodles of Ozarks. I didn't, I'm not saying that this story has that aspect to it because we do see something i mean it's in a fever dream right but we do see something in the woods but again it's left up to you well did he imagine it i mean he was tripping tripping on a hole in a paper heart bing crosby ladies and gentlemen what the hell <laughs> that's a stone temple pilots song title don't you dare does anybody know in this dairy really cares in this dairy really cares oh. no have a look no. to your story sign on a crap warning today's episode contains singing I'm just letting you dig yourself down. and oh. what's funny is the stupid robot says nothing he's got the ability to speak and to insult you and he says nothing you I like guys are the all singing all day Dancing crap of the world. I really enjoyed this story. I like the wilderness, the places where we are not masters, you know, where, where you can go in some place and be lost or be dwarfed or be reminded that these trees are older than we will ever be or no one has been in this spot for 50 years or 100 years. Things like that are really cool to me. I don't know if did in Sacramento are there places like that? Is everything built or, or uh, 
in Sacramento itself, it, developed. it's pretty developed, but you can go places, you know, very close by that are that way. Or you can go camping in the places with names like the Desolation Wilderness, and it's pretty uh, remote. I mean, the mountains are right there. And I think I've got a destination for our next family trip. All right. The Desolation Wilderness? The Desolation Wilderness, yeah. I spent a, a couple of uh, camping trips there. And isn't there an emo band also called the Distillation Wilderness? Distillation Wilderness. Ah, see, I'm, I've got to keep up. <laughs> when I was a kid, there was a, a canyon that we would go up to, and they would built all these pipes to carry runoff, you know, melted snow down to the town so the town would have drinking water. And there were some that they had just abandoned or that had fallen apart or something like that. So there were a bunch of horizontal pipes on these hills and you could go up there and the wind would blow through these pipes, these tubes mm -hmm. and make a whistling sound that was really unnerving. Uh -huh. So of course there was a, an urban legend that the kids told about you know, a guy named Buzzy Lamb that had gone up there and he'd been decapitated on his motorcycle. And if you listened on, you know, a moonlit night, you could hear him out there trying to find his head. And I thought it was cool, the sound up there and the Buzzy Lamb story. And I remember there was a time that a bunch of us were up there and there were a couple of pretty boys from the rich side of town. I, mean, I hate to refer to my past as pages out of the outsiders, but S.E. Hinton wrote extensively about my youth. Uh -huh. And uh, there were a couple of kids up there, boys that were, you know, there to impress the girls. And my buddy Rhett started telling this Buzzy Lamb story. And this kid, this rich kid that was there to, you know, feel up Rhett's ex-girlfriend, he started to really freak out about And he's like, hey, man, that's not cool. Stop talking about that. You're not supposed to talk about that. Th th those things, things in the, those spir the spirits will hear you. And no, you can't. And, and he was freaking out. And <laughs> The, the members of our little group that didn't have girls there were quite enjoying this breakdown by this kid. And in fact, my buddy Rhett refers to it all the time. <laughs> yeah, that was a joyous moment for him. <laughs> this guy babbling and making a total imbecile of himself just over this... I can't even do the sound, but it was a... You know, imagine a woodwind instruments. Um, you know, like a hollow echoey reverberation uh, along with wind and, and, and rustling branches and stuff and to me that's a delightful sound there's something just wow that's so cool but if I were say alone and I heard that yeah I w would want a handy pair of Depends good for you already wear a Depends a rich outfield thanks robot what's it like not to have genitals at all why would you ask me that? Well, you already know the answer from personal experience. Oh, okay. Well, I can tell that this uh, voice chip was a wise investment, wasn't it? It really enhances the show. Thanks for whoever donated. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> now you're telling people not to donate. Oh, I don't know. I quite enjoyed this story, and I don't really have anything else to say. I, I'm, I, I think I've said too much already. <laughs> not quite as much as the robot has, but I've said too much. It's that time again, Rish. Okay. Thanks for listening. I have been Rish Outfield. No, not that time. It's time to beg. Uh, I'll break your arm if you say beg for donations. I'd like to see you try. Well, I'd like to see to see Anne Hathaway in a black silky negligee. Um. Okay, you win. I'll do the asking, folks. You know we uh, pay our authors. All these stories they don't they don't come free and. We'd like to continue to do that. As, as a matter of fact, we'd like to be able to pay our authors better because what we pay them is, frankly, a pittance. So if you can see it in your heart to donate, it would be to a good cause. If you like the show, just stop by our website. We've got little buttons up in the right-hand side that you can click on, and it'll take you to PayPal, and you can chuck a few bucks our way. That would be awesome. Ooh, pretty. All right, well... I guess that uh, brings us to the end of our journey for the day. Thank you, Steve, for letting us do this story on the show. And I'm not sure if you've been published all over in the world with other stories, but you're welcome to send us another one. We don't really talk about submissions much anymore just because we're overwhelmed. But uh, 
Thank you. My uncle was right. I loved this story. And so I thank my uncle as well for making me, for grabbing my hair and pushing my face into the story and said, eat it! This week on a very special episode of Blossom. Yeah. And hey, Backpacker Magazine, I don't know how often you run stories, but thanks for running this one. And if you don't do it often, you should do more. <laughs> See, that's an interesting question, is how many letters to the editor of, why did you publish this horrible, <laughs> this thing traumatized my whole family. I've stopped backpacking because I'm too scared to go outside. Exactly. I, I would <laughs> like to know how many pro letters they got and how many con letters they got. But we will never know. No, we won't. Is that good? I guess so. Hopefully we will be back again next time with another story. I have been Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklovich. Thanks for listening. Good night. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. When you close your eyes... Do you think about meat? This is why you don't have a Parsec Award, Rish. Had reported that a Chamber of Commerce director had been sued for sexual harassment when he hadn't. <coughs> People go hiking around here? Gus looked like he had just eaten a piece of bad squirrel meat. Well, this is Backpacker Magazine after all, so of course they go hack it. Take me home tonight. Oh, no. Not Eddie Money. I love Eddie Money. You need to love him, too. Have you been drinking? No, I, I told you I was done with all. Have you even left the hotel and the place you've been eating? You said you wanted a mood piece, right? I'm gathering mood. Uh. Ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been drinking? Yes, sir. Just had a big gulp. Where was the last place the kid was seen? Oh, he was walking out of the diner toward the river. And what's next to the river? I didn't like where this conversation was going. I didn't like it at all. The woods, I said. It came out as a question. You planning to go there? Well, well of course I'm planning to... Call me by the end of the week, she said. You better have a story about camping out where the kid disappeared because this is Backpacker Magazine. Camping. Important. You want to know about trails or anything to do with those woods, you need to talk to Mrs. Loomis, the retired librarian who lives down in Goodnight Hollow, not far from Walnut Shade. I pictured a gray-haired, muffin-faced crone. I saw piles of knitting needles and gangs of house cats. Far, far from any dumpsters, though. No. <laughs> And full-size cats, for that they they were able to take care of themselves. They could have hopped out of a dumpster if anybody even let them near one. These were winged cats, frankly. <laughs> I mean, they just... If anybody wanted to do them harm, they would just... <clears throat> <laughs> Too soon? Sorry. You want to know about trails or anything else to do with those woods... You need to talk to Mrs. Loomis, the retired librarian who lives down in Goodnight Hollow, not far from Walnut Shade. Damn the names they give these condos these days. She turned, did something to a vase on a table. Something naughty. Her eyes were like marbles, lovely, cold, and lifeless. What do you think? Should I do that again without burping? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Wait, well, without burping was the, 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 uh, what sorry. we're going for with this one. My shirt stuck to my back. Streaks of lightning cut through the clouds, but I heard no thunder. Aw, you don't have to do sound effects. <laughs> uh, do you like? Can we have some water now? I asked. I couldn't remember ever being so thirsty. 
Got something better, BC said, and thrust a plastic bottle filled with a yellowish liquid into my hand. Piss? I don't want to drink no piss. I pointed my car toward Northern California, where I had always imagined quiet, friendly little streams and springy meadows and people with good skin and strong handshakes. Live in Northern California once. But leave before it makes you soft. That's right. Uh, is that a good one? <laughs> oh, come on. I'm trying to give you your money. It's a worth. strange one, anyways. The only people who walk into the Ozarks hidden hollows these days wear Gore Tex. Many carry mesh baskets and hunt for moral mushrooms and ginseng. And they all read Backpacker Magazine. Like every good person should. <laughs> Many carry mesh blankets and hunt for moral Baskets. mushrooms. Many carry mesh blankets. Mary. Many carry mesh baskets. Damn it! Almost. Many carry mesh baskets and hunt for. Is it morale or moral? I don't know. Should we check? I don't know. Here's one thing, just for the, just for you, Wendy. We'll put it in the outtakes. I was never really a fan of the Fantastic Four, mm -hmm. but my buddy in L.A., Matthew, loved the Fantastic Four. They were his go-to team, the way that I loved the X-Men, or you love Spider-Man, you know, whatever Spider you love, bestiality. What, what is it that you love? Uh, bestiality, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> he would uh, talk to me about what Doctor Doom was like and what these characters' personalities were, because I just vaguely knew of them, and... I asked him one time about Dr. Doom's face, you know. Have they ever shown him without his mask? And he's like, no, it's always left to the imagination of how horrible it is. And, and I asked him, well, how did that happen? You know, how did he get all deformed or mutilated or burned or whatever he is? And he told me the story. And the, but then he said that there was a Marvel writer. He was, a, he was a, a Fantastic Four writer for a while. I'm sorry, I don't know who it was. But he thought that Dr. Doom's face was fine but that he was so convinced that he had been horribly burned that he continued to wear this mask. And that whenever somebody saw him with the mask off, their reaction of shock was that he hmm. was normal. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this adds a new level of <laughs> insanity to this character that I love. That is so cool. And I asked him about that. It's like, oh, well, so have they ever, you know, how, is that part of marvel continuity and he's like no no like lots of people will draw him and you can see like the burns you know in the eye holes of the mask and stuff so there's that but to me that was just a really neat take on it of just uh they're kind of the same way that, that i was saying about darth vader in the actual episode right but just you know imagine the worst thing that you can and rather than having to compete with the worst thing that you can imagine he's fine there's nothing wrong. <laughs> right. To me, that was really neat. And, and I don't know. The news today is they're casting. They're trying to cast this reboot of Fantastic Four. Fox owns X-Men and Fantastic Four, and they're trying to reboot them both around the same time. But I don't think they'll start on Fantastic Four until X-Men comes out next year. I think that those films are kind of reviled, the two Fox Fantastic Four movies. I certainly don't like them, but... I also am not a super diehard follower of Fantastic Four. Uh huh. What, did you see the movies? Did I you did. I them? saw both of them. I don't revile them. I don't think they were especially good either. They're just kind of in the so so category. I remember thinking that the second one was better than the first one. I did too. But uh, it seemed like they tried to make the Fantastic Four too hip. It seemed to have gone the wrong route with it. I don't know. It didn't seem to work. Well, the I, the casting are didn't we, work. By the way, are we? How long are we going on this Fantastic Four thing? Because you already said that the story that brought it up was not part of the episode. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it just didn't. We can keep going, but I'm it just felt like it was probably something that I would cut because it's so tangential, and we're talking about Darth Vader with his mask off, which was inspired by Blair Witch, which was inspired by this story of uh -huh. what you see in the audio and all that stuff. Well, so it's we like always seven degrees of, of Kevin Bacon, where it's like, okay, dude, you've gone eight degrees. <laughs> that, that, that's not allowed. I'm fine with tangents. So it's the way we go. I was just curious. But what were we saying? Oh, with the casting... Uh, Michael Chiklis, I thought, was really good as yeah. the thing. Why he, they didn't just make him look like the thing, I don't know. Jessica Alba was the biggest misfire there. Not that she's not beautiful, 
But dude, just cast a blonde girl instead of doing this weird thing with her eyes. She looked like one of the friggin' white chicks. <laughs> and oh, I don't know. We'll see what happens. I'm sure Fox will do a terrible job because they don't care. And that was the main impression I got when I saw the first Fantastic Four movie. It was, you know, we, we just we don't really care about the continuity of the comics and all this stuff. The stuff where they did with Doctor Doom. We know that there is a source material, but we don't care about that. It's just a funny book. And you can't not go wrong when you have that attitude. Somebody somewhere loves that comic book more than anything. Loves those characters the way my buddy Matthew did. Right. And uh, You're not will... going to please them, that's for sure. I'm sorry. Okay, let's go back to the episode. Moonlight Night. You could hear him out there trying to find his head. You know where I'm going with this, because in one of my stories, I said many a kid had shit his pants up there. <laughs> no, I'm not, not going to say that, but it's probably gauche to quote your own story, huh? If I knew what gauche was, I would say that yes or no, but that's one of those words I've never been able to uh, learn. I think you have to be homosexual to really know what gauche yeah. means. <laughs> you like, have to be French or a homosexual which basically is the same. Two sides of a coin. <laughs> uh, that's also for you, Wendy.